Hello, and welcome to our webinar on maximizing portfolio value through business transformation. My name is Teresa Huang. I'm from Planisware, and I'll be moderating today's discussion. But before we begin, there are just a few quick logistics I'd like to go over. First of all, to preserve sound quality, all attendees are on mute. But if you happen to think of any questions during the session, please do feel free to use the questions panel at the bottom of the webinar dashboard. We've allotted plenty of time at the end of the session to go over any questions that you may have. Also, um, I've gotten these questions a few times, but this session will be recorded. Um, so we'll be sending the recording to you by tomorrow by email. Um, so you can feel free to review, review it at your leisure. And you can also feel free to share it with your colleagues. And now without further ado, I'm delighted to introduce today's guest speakers, Mark Lane from Tegan Point and Jeremy Scully from Planisware. First, my colleague Jeremy Scully is a director at Planisware, and we've worked together starting from almost 10 years ago, and I've, since I've known him, he's worn a variety of hats while working within the PPM arena. Jeremy has worked with both large and small companies alike, advising C-level as well as program and project management teams on how to ensure that there's a robust process in place for strategic planning, portfolio management, and project execution, and also that there's the technology to support these processes, as well as sound change management to ensure adoption. And just a brief introduction on Planisware for those who are not familiar with us. We're a global provider of enterprise PPM software solutions with 20 years of experience serving leaders in new product development and innovation. We offer best practice-based software and industry expertise to support innovation business processes, and we help organizations drive strategy to execution, accelerate time to launch, maximize resource utilization, and ultimately increase the value of the product portfolio. This all in a single integrated platform that improves how organizations collect, manage, and analyze data for decision making. Our customers include Pfizer, Ford, Airbus, HP, Milken, and many others. Now moving to Mark, with more than 25 years of experience working with premier new product development organizations including Merck, AstraZeneca, GE, and LifeCell, first as a scientist and then across various product development roles in project management and program leadership, Mark is undeniably a seasoned pro in PPM. His areas of expertise include strategy development and execution, change management, program and project leadership and management, and new product development through launch. Mark and Jeremy, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Teresa. Glad to be yes. here. Yes. Thank you, Teresa, for the introduction, and welcome everyone to the webinar. I'm really looking forward to our discussion today because I think the, the sum total of what Jeremy and I are going to present to you uh, regarding strategy, business processes, software, and change management. To me, these are all really critical aspects of driving portfolio management success. Uh, having said that, I want to manage expectations just a bit in that we won't be you know, trying to advise you on exactly the right mix of products or levels of investment, et cetera, as that's very specific to your business. But we're going to give you a, a good overview of what it takes to be successful in portfolio management. I want to spend just one minute on Tegan Point uh, to introduce you to our company. We're a management consulting firm. We focus on business transformation. We not only partner with you to help develop the strategy, but we also work with you all along the way to help ensure execution. We've worked with a number of the top firms, as you can see here. Um, this is just a selection of a, a, several of our clients in both life sciences as well as other industries. Uh, and Tegan Point has won a number of, of awards over the years. We've been recognized as Consulting Magazine's one of their seven small jewels. And we're consistently year on year on the list of Inc. 5000, America's fastest growing companies. And personally, the thing I find most rewarding about uh, working at Tegan Point is I have the opportunity to work with 60 seasoned professionals, all of whom have deep in the trenches and hands-on experience in the industries in which they work. I like to think of us as being uh, business and subject matter experts first and consultants second. So moving on to our agenda slide, essentially, although I have a few other comments. Uh, this will be the format for the webinar. We'll talk about the business and portfolio strategy. I'll have a bit to say about business processes and project management. Jeremy will demonstrate some software aspects and, and speak to some other key points. And then I'll talk a little bit about decision making as well as change management. 
I'd like to begin by asking a couple of questions, which I know you can't answer at the moment, but I ask you to think about these. Um, is your organization perhaps wasting resources on projects that don't create value? Or perhaps you're familiar with the, the scenario of having too many projects, projects ongoing and not enough resources to execute them. So I think putting in place a portfolio management process can help you address not only these, but a lot of other questions that will allow you to maximize the value delivered to the business. Now, given this short time frame today, we won't get into great detail on the how to put in place a business process or how to best utilize the software. We'll, rather, we're going to keep it at a bit of a high level, but both Jeremy and I would be happy to discuss any aspects of these offline with you in more detail. And before moving on, as, as now an introduction to really the meat of the, the presentation, I attended a portfolio conference last week, which I hope some of the folks uh, on the webinar were also in attendance, because I'm sure you would agree with me there were a few things that were obvious that came out of, of that meeting, as well as others I've attended. And that is, to be successful in portfolio management, you need both a good software platform as well as the business processes that support it. And what was interesting at this the conference that I attended is that even though most of the presenters or many of the presenters certainly had uh, software platforms and analysis approaches and governance, etc., in place for many years, a number of the business processes that I'm going to talk about today were still challenging for them. And so we want to review what some of those are as, the, as we get a little further into the presentation. I wanted to begin by just talking a bit about strategy formulation and, and importantly, what is strategy? Your corporate and portfolio strategies really need to align together as well as then your individual project portfolio needs to clearly support both of those. You need to make sure they're aligned uh, before moving into managing and balancing the portfolio. For example, if one of the key pillars of your strategy would be to make sure you have a certain uh, mix or play in innovation type projects, but you have few innovation projects in your pipeline, then you would need to reassess and realign your projects to your business strategy. And as far as what is strategy, I, I recall a discussion a few years ago uh, in one of the companies I worked with where the leadership team was discussing their business strategy. And I started asking questions about what were some of the key deliverables that we might want to target and would we have enough budget or resources to support them. And more than one person in that meeting seemed confused and suggested I was being strategic. So I wanted to make sure I define strategy for you in, in this context. Strategy to me bridges that gap between those high level goals the lofty goals that get posted on, on a website uh, for the company or delivered in a town hall. Strategy forms that bridge between goals and the tactics you need to deliver. So strategy is not just the goals, but it's also the roadmap, and it should provide an overarching set of principles that help drive behavior and decision making in the organization and help people to prioritize the work that they do and importantly the work that perhaps they should not be doing on a day-to-day -day basis. So how do you go about developing a portfolio or really any other type of strategy? Now, I, I forewarn you, this slide is, is somewhat simplified, but if you think about the types of questions that I'm about to discuss, I hope you'll realize that you really need to have a good understanding of the answers to these questions before you get into the, the details of strategic planning with uh, the quote from Yogi Berra that's included on the blog post, if, if many of you have seen that. And that is, if you don't know where you're going, you might end up someplace else. What I interpret this to mean is you really need to understand where your business is going, what are you trying to accomplish with the, whatever the strategic initiative is. And you need to make sure that everyone's aligned to those goals and to where you're headed. You then need to discuss and have alignment on what does success actually look like. This could be in terms of specific revenue goals over a specific time frame that you would like to meet. Maybe in a product strategy, it's a specific targeted market share, or maybe a process improvement to a strategic initiative to try and reduce time to market. But you need to align on what, are, what does success look like. You then need to consider what are the business constraints that you have to work under. 
Now that could be resource availability, time to launch, budget limitations, and and I know some people may hold the view that you know in order to be strategic, you you really shouldn't be thinking about or have constraints. But in reality, budget, resource, and time in particular are things that will impact your ability to execute a particular strategy. So you need to keep those in mind as you think about your strategic development. You then need to explore and understand what are gaps in your knowledge that might exist. In thinking of a product development strategy, you will need to understand how does your product perform? Does it perform as you would need it to or expect it to in the marketplace? And if not, then your strategy and your roadmap may need to include additional testing. It may need to include, in the case of a pharmaceutical product, a set of clinical trials or what have you. But in other words, it helps inform some of the key deliverables. You may need to know in a portfolio setting what is the resource capacity that I have available by, by specific function within the company. Or what data do I need to differentiate my product in the market? Once you know all of those, then we come back to the other quote from the, the blog post that, that many of you have seen. And that is that victorious warriors win first. And the corollary is defeated warriors go to war then seek to win. And my interpretation of this is that you, you need to have a bit of a plan. You need to understand what it takes to win and how you plan to deliver that before you go to war. So I hope you can see that at least in the beginning of, of your strategic discussions that answering these questions first will help guide a lot of, of your forward thinking. Now every strategy also needs a roadmap, and this is a high-level roadmap. It's not a detailed project plan. Um, as you see in the quote here, a good plan today is better than a perfect plan tomorrow. So I'm not suggesting that you really get very detailed here, but I do want you to resist the temptation to ready fire, aim, and take the tame time to aim and understand a bit more about where you're going and how to get there. But focus on the process of planning and the discussions and not developing a detailed plan. Align or articulate and then align with the key stakeholders what it will take to win to deliver the strategy. You don't want to over plan, but you do want to define several of the key deliverables how you would need to execute those, perhaps any critical interdependencies among deliverables, and then, of course, whether or not you have any budget or resource constraints. This is a framework that we at Tag and Point use to, to help clients develop a transformation strategy and execute as well. And the framework, as pictured, goes something like this. You need to first assess your business as well as create your strategy. And in assessing your business, you're not just looking for new strategic opportunities, but you're also looking at the, the current ways of working, the current processes or models, looking for improvement opportunities that could help you deliver the strategy. You then need to come together to form your transformation roadmap. And once that's established, you can begin to initiate the various strategic and operational improvement projects. And importantly, you need to provide the necessary oversight not only in the form of governance to, to sort of you know, be uh, executive sponsors and, and make decisions, but also to provide rapid issue escalation and resolution to keep things moving forward. And this will then allow you to reach your future state model. Now, again, this is very high level, but this is the framework that, that we like to employ. Now, moving on to some of the business processes that I, I've mentioned in the past. And I, you could think of these as well for many people as in terms of project management and how you manage some of the information and data. But I mentioned earlier, an overwhelming view at the portfolio conference I attended recently was that without these uh, foundational business processes in place and well established, then implementing a software uh, or review process is not by itself going to drive portfolio success. So if you look at some of these, I hope that they'll resonate with you. One of the first things you need to make sure you do is to establish a single source of truth or a single source of data. That is to make sure that you're across projects you have a consistent use of assumptions, algorithms, calculations, or decision criteria, that there's one source of data regarding project status, cost, valuation, probabilities of success, specific valuation parameters that I've listed there, as well as budget and resource capacity and demand. 
you also need to have a holistic view of the portfolio. Your infrastructure and processes need to be able to support both project and portfolio views of budget in terms of estimated as well as actual cost as the project progresses, the resources needed by function, the status of the project, launch dates, etc. You need to have, uh, again, not just a project view, but you need to be able to have a portfolio view of all of these as well. What this will mean is you're going to need to establish some sort of centralized data repository. Now, I have worked in and I know of other organizations where this was not in place, and so preparing for a portfolio review when you've got to pull together data from various different sources and projects and business units and functions, it becomes quite a task and you actually spend more time preparing for the review than you are thinking strategically about the outcomes. Need to make sure at a portfolio level you have agreed criteria for project selection, evaluation, prioritization, and termination. And make sure that the project decisions you make are being made in the context of the whole portfolio and not just the individual project decision that's being requested. And of course, ensure that senior leaders are all aligned on the various portfolio metrics that you'll use to evaluate the portfolio's performance. Another key challenge, which was a highlight of, of the portfolio meeting as, as well as based on my experience, is to make sure you have executive buy-in and alignment uh, to help drive effective decision making. You need to align on decision and prioritization criteria. And I say here, avoid the advocacy approach. You would rather have a fact-based decision approach than have one in which the projects all come parading through one after another, um, as a colleague has said, singing for their supper. In other words, advocating strongly for their project without really focusing on the facts and the data that will help drive decisions. There also needs to be clear, a clear governance structure with membership that is well established. And importantly, what are the accountabilities and decision rights of the folks around the table? I'll talk a bit more about this uh, in a couple of later slides, but perhaps you don't need everyone around the table to be a decision maker depending on the stage of the project. And that, that is a structure that many companies use where it's decision by committee and we'll come back to an alternative structure to that later on. Now any of you that have worked in larger companies, which I expect many have, you realize that uh, several of these things I've been talking about, in particular suggesting that we establish a single source of truth, can be very challenging across functions, across business units, and other parts of the business. So it's not without understanding of the challenge here, but if you're able to put that in place, your portfolio process can be much more effective. I'm going to take what, I, what you may first interpret as a, a brief side road for just a minute. But in my view, these two skill sets I list here on this, this slide, program management and project management, really can help to establish the, uh, the foundational processes for portfolio management, in particular, that single source of truth and focus on the value of the portfolio. So let's take a look at first program management. In my view, program management focuses on outcomes or benefits realization for both the product, individual products in the pipeline, but also for the portfolio as well. There's an integrated product development strategy that helps drive alignment across the organization as well as driving value into the product. The program manager focuses on strategic risk management. We'll look at various scenarios as the project progresses, perhaps prioritizing or reprioritizing certain activities to deliver. And they focus a lot on stakeholder alignment and engagement to make sure that things progress and deliver value. Contrast that at least a bit to project management, which I think is more of a focus on outputs and deliverables, specific deliverables. There's a cross-functionally integrated project plan, but it's at a different level. It's very detailed. This is your you know, several hundred line Gantt chart with specific dates and durations, etc. Project management should be focusing mostly on operational or execution risk. They should, of course, develop and monitor the timelines and costs for the project and, and really provide the basis for uh, monitoring execution status and providing reports to management. So I think the two of these together really go a long way in helping to provide that single source of truth that is uh, 
elusive to so many organizations. Another structural characteristic that I would suggest you consider is co-locating some of these key roles in the same function. So in terms of an organization structure, including program, project, and portfolio management all within one function and one leadership. And that leadership should be at the right level of the organization. It's always amazed me how I think we all realize that organizational success depends on executing projects, but functions like program and project management are often um, you know, relegated to the, the senior director level and, and sort of buried or, or marginalized a bit into other functions of the organization. When in fact, if project success leads to business success, I believe that these types of functions should be at a, a VP level in terms of leadership and that that leader needs to sit on the executive team as a separate function and partner with their colleagues on the leadership team to drive value. So Jeremy, I'd like to pass it over to you to go ahead and give us a demonstration of the software. Great. Thanks, Mark. I appreciate it. So for today, for the scenario that we'll walk through, um, I will play the role of a portfolio manager at a large science and te uh, technology company. And the problem that we're going to walk through is that we have a history of funding projects that may not be aligned with our strategic goals. Uh, and we have a history of missing our revenue goals. So our management, our senior leadership has asked us to, my, me and my team, to run an analysis to determine if our current portfolio is aligned with the strategic goals, if, we're, uh, if we'll be able to hit our revenue goals, and then also su suggest a roadmap and some recommendations on um, how to deliver the, the strategic goals. So with that, Teresa, if you can give me control. And now you can see that I'm in the software. So this is the Planisware version 6 enterprise por uh, portfolio management solution. Um, this is my home page. Every user has a home page just like this. So it's a wall. It's very social, uh, media-like. Um, helps a lot with collaboration. Uh, you can choose what you follow over here. So you can follow users. You can follow team members. You can follow colleagues. You can also follow projects, programs, and portfolios. So you can see here that I'm following this project that's in danger and it's in a lot of trouble and you can actually, you know, I can comment on it and I can say, okay, so we should, we should review, right? Let's see what's happening. And all I have to do is just press enter, it'll save and it'll add that comment and everybody that's following this project will be able to see that I, that I commented on that. Um, just to orient you a little bit as well, um, over here on the menu bar, uh, any screen in Planisware, you can share, you can add it to a meeting, you can send it by an email, or you can post it to your wall or someone else's wall. Um, you can export anything to Excel, uh, PowerPoint, PDF, um, you can get help, search for projects, and, and find your messages here. So it's kind of a one-stop shop for, for collaboration and, and maintaining visibility on what's happening with your projects, programs, and portfolios. You can also see that we have a calendar control, um, and I've set up a meeting for today, which is the business transformation portfolio review to try and answer our, uh, our management's questions. So we click on that, we'll drill right into the meeting. Uh, just to orient you a little bit, you can see that I'm the organizer, you can see the category of the meeting, title, the time, the date. You can take notes and capture the meeting. Who's to you to organize your meetings and invite people to your meetings direct tool. Uh, we integrate with Outlook, with Gmail, or emails. Just by typing their email address, add, they'll receive the calendar invite um, in their in their email in their inbox. Well, we hear an interesting feature with Planisware is you can create. You can take any screen and create the agenda. So we've created a virtual walk that will walk through what is the leadership's overarching goals and vision, what key constraints must we can. So click on the screenshot. The first thing that we want to do, oh, sorry, I forgot to save the data. The first thing that we want to do is we want to look at what is the overarching 
for senior leadership. And through their strategic planning process, they came up with uh, um, uh, an investment scenario and ex expected revenue type, so continuous, disruptive, progressive, and tactical. You, you can see that you can also drill into the specific areas and see the subcategories, for instance. So for disruptive, you can see new market, new services, new, uh, new to company, etc. Or you can see the investment scenario that our management has laid out. So their vision is to spend $20 million, $5 million, and $450,000 over the next three years on disruptive. You can also see for continuous, uh, progressive, and tactical. Um, here, Jeremy, this is where... I, I saw Jeremy, I thought it might be interesting to understand where these revenues come from at some point. Where are you getting these? Yeah, so there's there's a great question. There's there's two different ways. One is this can be planned uh, directly into the software. Um, the planning process can take place in the Planis, in the Planisware solution. Planisware offers functionality and modules for strategic planning, portfolio management, resource management, stage gate, as well as project management and project execution. So it can be done directly in here. Um, um, it can also be imported through Excel if management is using the Excel. So it really depends on, on how they're doing their strategic planning process. Okay. Thank you. Um, yep. So on the for the expected return, you can see the, the return here. So basically, for this scenario, for this strategy for, that the organization has, the overarching goals, we have a budget of $62.2 million in spend and we're expected to deliver $139.2 million in revenue over the next three years. So one of the questions that our management has is, or the first one, is are we aligned with, with our strategic goals? Are we currently spending our money on the right projects that will deliver our strategy? And I'm going to clean this up just a little bit to make it a little easier to, to see. I'm going to remove all the subcategories and just put in the high level Oh, sorry, hit shift instead of control. So if you hit control and click, insert. Now we can see over here, you'll see the projects that are currently funded and that we're currently working on. So for disruptive, these are the projects that we're working on. Um, same thing for continuous and progressive. On the top row of bubble charts, you can see how our street, uh, the definition of our strategic vision, the percentage of uh, spend that we want to have by project type, by business unit, and by strategic access. On the bottom, you can see where we're actually spending our money. So very quickly, you can see that we're not aligned. Right? We're supposed to be spending 72% on disruptive, and we're only spending 6%. So management's intuition was correct that we're not aligned. The next question that they had was, will we meet our revenue goals? Can we deliver this, the revenue or the, uh, the return that we're expected over the next three years? So if we click on the revenue analysis report, you can see the green line, which is our revenue goal, and you can see very quickly we have a, a huge gap. So we're not even going to come close. So we need to do something different. In Planus, where you're able to create scenarios very quickly just by clicking on the boxes and adding these projects in. Now, remember that this does not um, affect the, the current deliverables or timelines or resources of the projects that are funded and underway. We're simply creating a what-if scenario to try and answer this question. How can we deliver our strategic goals and, or how close can we come? So just for sake of argument and efficiency, I've added in every single project that we have. And when I click Save, you'll see that these revenues change. Might take a little bit of a second here. There's a lot of data. So now we're a lot closer, maybe even being able to obtain the, the, the goals. We're a lot closer. And one of the best things about Planisware is that because we have all of the project and program data for resources, cost, revenue, timelines, everything, um, we can drill in to see any project at any time. And so if we drill into, just trying to find the, the right one here, if we drill into this project, 
this will take us to the project P&L. And every project in Planisware has a P&L attached to it. It works exactly like a spreadsheet. <clears throat> you can edit it directly in the tool. You can export it or you, and you can re-import it as well. The beauty of it is that it's, it can be controlled. So instead of having to email a P&L to 15 people, 15 people come to one single source and update only the sections that they have access to, update, which ensures data integrity. The other great thing is because it's in a database, it can be sliced and diced at any, in any way. The project P&Ls roll up to program P&Ls, and program P&Ls roll up to the portfolio P&L, which we're looking at now. Okay, so if we go back to the revenue analysis, you see that we're pretty close to delivering our revenue goals, but we also want to check the alignment because we were not aligned at all. So if we go back to the strategic alignment, we can quickly look at that, and we'll notice that we're better off now. We're much better aligned. We still have some issues, but remember, perfection is the enemy of good. Right? And right now, we just want to get closer than we were so that we can go back to our management and have a solid recommendation for it. So we're, we're closer, so that's better. Right? So now we go back to our meeting, and the first conclusion and recommendation that we have is we were not aligned Ah, can't type, sorry. And the second one is we were short on revenue. We can deliver, let's say, 90%. Okay? So we'll save that. The next question that we need to answer <clears throat> now that we know that we're, we're aligned and we can come close to delivering our strategic goals in the form of revenue is what key constraints must we consider? What key unanswered questions do we have? And in this case, Mark mentioned it earlier, in this case, we're going to look at rev uh, resources. So I'm drilling into the resources now, <clears throat> and it looks pretty much the same. You have all your projects that are in this scenario. Now each project has a color to it. We're still looking at the over the three years and in the high tech portfolio. Um, and you can see here the roll up of all the resources that come from the actual project plans. And as I mentioned, we have full resource management capabilities, so all that, all that rolls up to the portfolio level. And you can see for the high tech division, we have some bottlenecks, but we also have quite a bit of availability in the future. Our suspicion is that the security appliance resource group is what's driving the majority of our resource bottlenecks. And mainly this project here, the SEA 1002, which is a very large project. And this is actually this red one here. And you can see there's quite a bit of resources there. So we want to double check on that resource group to see if that's driving the resource bottleneck. And if it's not, which one is? If it is, how do we, how do we overcome that bottleneck? So I just very quickly switched and drilled down into the security appliance group. It takes a second to refresh, and you'll see that we have some serious bottlenecks. The green line represents the threshold. So we have some very, very serious bottlenecks. Now, we could start taking projects out, right? So we could take this project out, which is driving the majority of the resources. But if we do that, remember, we won't hit our revenue goals, <clears throat> and we won't be aligned any, and, anymore. So we actually don't want to do that here. What we want to do is go into the time shift module, which Planisware has created. Yeah, let me save the data. Forgot to hit save. And in the time shift piece of it, this allows us as portfolio managers to have a high level view of the roadmap, the start and end dates, and the timing, the sequencing of the portfolio. Now, which very interesting is how we're able to overcome this resource bottleneck with, within the security appliance group. And there's a couple of ways to do it. One, we could do the time shift, which I'll come back to next. The second is the wait. And the waiting system within this uh, piece of functionality within Planetsware expresses our confidence level in whether or not we will actually do the project. 
it's not a confidence level of whether it will be tech or whether it will be feasible or successful in the marketplace or technically. It's simply to say that we are, for instance, with this project because it's out in the future, we are only 10% confident that we'll actually do this project, right? So if I hit save, you'll see these yellow bars down here almost completely go away because we've reduced the load of resources. It doesn't mean that if we fund the project, they'll only receive 10% of the, the resources. They'll still get 100%. It's just at a strategic level, we're expressing our confidence level. So if we make some changes here, and let's say 50% here, we'll hit save. If we do this for a few of the projects, we can start to alleviate some of the bottlenecks. So we'll say 75% here because we're pretty close to that one. We'll say 50% here. We'll hit save. And let's see what that does. And you'll see that the resources will start to go down at least a little bit. This doesn't alleviate the bottleneck, but with Planets where in the time shift piece of it, you can drag and drop any of these projects and delay them. So we're going to drag this out into the future. You won't see too much change just because there's very there's a little uh, there's not much confidence in that project at this point. This one, if we drag it out, you'll see that it changes quite a bit. The great thing about this is that our senior leadership has given us the goal of delivering a certain amount of revenue within three years. So as long as we stay within this three-year window, we're still meeting their goal. We're still going to be able to deliver the revenue. Even though we're delaying things, we'll still be able to deliver the revenue within th the three years. So this allows us to sequence the portfolio in a way that helps us to overcome these resource gaps and ma maintain alignment and deliver our revenue. You can see this things are starting to shift and the picture is starting to look a little bit better. You remember that this red one is the security appliance one, so we really don't want to change that one because that's the biggest driver of our revenue. So I'm just going to do a couple more because this can actually take quite a bit of time. I'm sure everyone as portfolio managers or project managers that are on the line today know that how much time this can actually take to, to alleviate all bottlenecks. But you get the idea of how this works. Okay. So if we go back to our meeting, we have another conclusion and another recommendation. Kind of went away, hit enter too many times, sorry about that. So now we can say that we have, uh, we have some serious bottlenecks, but a roadmap to overcome them. Okay? And we'll hit save so we don't lose that lose those notes. So one of the benefits of having any PPM solution and Planetware specifically is that when we go to our meeting with our senior leadership and we present this roadmap to them, we present these recommendations to them, um, we are confident that when they ask us questions as they will right there and then in that meeting, what if we gave you an extra $50 million? Uh, what are those five projects? Um, what is this project and who approved that project? You have all of those answers at your fingertips with a couple of clicks. And you know that you can go through and model things very, very quickly in the system and present back those answers there and then which avoids having to go and do, have multiple little sweaty meetings to prepare for a big sweaty meeting weeks later after you maybe have missed some opportunities, lost money, and um, frankly wasted a bunch of time, which I've seen with, with some organizations. So that's the demonstration for today. Um, it gives us a, a good idea of how you can, when you're presented with a situation and some questions from the management, how you can very quickly go through, find the answers, come up with suggestions and recommendations, and present that back to your management. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mark, and Mark will go into the next part of the webinar. Okay, thank you, Jeremy. I just, uh, Jeremy, if you could just quickly make sure sound check that everyone can hear me okay? Yep. Okay, good. 
So again, thank you, Jeremy. And, and you know, it occurred to me, everyone, as we were listening to Jeremy's presentation and watching that, that I, I hope you have a, an appreciation, a better appreciation now for how the various business processes uh, I had been discussing prior really feed into you know, the, the software and the capabilities of the software and how important it would be to have accurate data as you need to make comparisons across projects, consider delaying projects, etc. And, and that's really the reason Jeremy and I have decided to partner on this website uh, webinar really to, to help you see how Planswear and Tag and Point and organizations like that can help you get both of these critical aspects in place as you embark on or try to improve your portfolio management uh, capabilities. So what I wanted to do in, to close off in a few minutes is, is, and open it up for questions, is to talk a little bit about governance and decision making. Um, what are the core benefits of having a portfolio review process? Uh, I, I just listed a few here. It, what it should do is allow you, as, as Jeremy showed, to, is the investment strategy aligned with the business strategy on a project basis. What's the value of the pipeline? What's the status and the throughput? It should allow you to increase the efficiency there. Also around resources, to understand resource capacity and, and have an optimal resource loading according to the various business needs and importance. And importantly, it should allow you to redeploy resources as projects are reprioritized. As one project is terminated, you can shift resources to another. And it should give you visibility into resource gaps and constraints that you might have. This is a very short list of the questions that you might want to consider. Uh, as you're doing portfolio analysis, how is the current portfolio performing would be a key, um, a marketed portfolio would be one of the key questions. Will it deliver the value as Jeremy demonstrated? Can we shift resources? What are the opportunities that we have to accelerate or delay projects to help achieve our goals? And, and one that maybe we didn't talk about, or Jeremy didn't talk about was what is the impact of adding new proposed opportunities on value, cost, and resources, because we, we know that most of you work in a resource-constrained environment. So being able to do scenario analyses in the software to understand the impact of adding projects into the portfolio is a key question, that, a key capability that you'd like to have. I want to talk for a minute about portfolio optimization. And really, there are two fundamental questions that you need to ask first. Jeremy showed you the, how to answer the question in Planus where will the portfolio deliver on, on our particular goals? And he also mentioned you know, the, the resource piece and being able to assess whether or not you can deliver. Then you want to think about how the portfolio may be balanced um, overall to meet some of your other needs uh, in terms of maybe the risk tolerance, the, the amount of high risk versus low risk projects. Um, he had the one project that was a must do that had to stay in. How do you balance must do with discretionary? What about geographic expansion? Longer term projects, shorter term projects depending on your needs. So you want to be able to have this holistic view that allows you to look at the balance of projects in the portfolio in meeting your needs. And, and importantly, once you've gone through the exercise of balancing, then you'll need to go back and ask, does that rebalanced portfolio still deliver, and do we still have the resources um, to deliver the various projects? This is a little redundant with something Jeremy showed, just in a different uh, format, but I wanted to show this slide just to show you uh, something about you know, meeting your portfolio strategies. So on the left-hand side here, we have increasing probability of success, with the top left being the highest probability of success, and then anticipated commercial value increasing to the right. So if your strategy for your business required some you know, short-term increases, significant growth in commercial value or revenue, then this particular um, portfolio of projects may not be delivering what you would want because you've highly focused many of the projects here on the low end of commercial value. What asking those types of questions allows you to do is then redeploy projects, perhaps you terminate some projects here, and add in new projects that are maybe of differing levels of risk, but allow you to meet some of the revenue returns that you're interested in achieving. So that's just the, the real point there, because Jeremy demonstrated much more eloquently, is that you know 
you need to ask questions about the individual projects and how they relate to the portfolio success that you're looking for, and then you can make adjustments accordingly. I'm going to talk now about decision making um, and governance. So there is some level of process that's needed. I know you know many people feel like you know process is is a hindrance, but in this case, you really need some level of process. You need to ensure that there are clear accountabilities and decision rights, and you need to have a governance form that uh, creates a place for rapid issue escalation and resolution to keep things moving forward. I've talked before about the need for fact-based and not advocacy-driven decision making. You don't want the loudest voice in the room to be the only one that gets their projects funded. You want to pray, uh, fund projects based on, uh, as much as you can, facts and objective data versus advocacy. To do that, you'll need transparency and consistency of the data and that single source of, source of truth that we talked about. There also needs to be an alignment amongst leadership on the decision criteria and whether or not you're using scorecards. I haven't talked to, uh, about scorecards at this point. Scorecards, and depending on how you construct them, uh, is a way to look across projects, maybe in particular early projects where you don't have great revenue um, calculations or, or estimations, and compare those to later development projects. So you wouldn't focus only on revenues, but maybe there's a scorecard around strategic fit or other goals within the portfolio that would allow you to compare across projects. And importantly, you need to make sure that your individual project decisions are being made in the context of the whole portfolio. This next slide illustrates uh, what I think of as, as a relatively typical pharmaceutical product governance. Uh, it's focused on the phase of development. As many of you know, pharmaceutical products have phase one trials, phase two clinical trials, phase three. So there's a lot of focus typically on the phase of development. There are handoffs between not only teams, but often between uh, governance bodies. So there are various committees, research governance, early development, late development, and then the commercial development as well. So various governance bodies, various handoffs. And the imagery of a baton and a handoff there is, is on purpose because there's often not a lot of um, alignment or collaboration across those handoffs. And so uh, uh, many of you, I'm sure, are used to hearing the expression how projects are tossed over the wall to the next stage of development. Committees, as I said, are usually established for various phases of development with limited collaboration. And typically, all the committee members, as I alluded to earlier, except perhaps maybe a chair or co-chair as a tiebreaker, all the committee members tend to share the same decision rights, regardless of the phase of development that they're in. So I wanted to suggest uh, something that I, I like to think of as being less and more simplistic, but also a more holistic approach to product introduction, and that's illustrated in this slide. And, and I think this can be applied to any type of product in, in your portfolio. It's not limited to pharmaceuticals or anything like that because as you think about product development, all product development begins with an idea. You have to make sure that that idea is feasible and that it's, then you can at least have some sort of a development plan. It doesn't need to be in the early stages. It doesn't need to be incredibly detailed. You would then need to test the performance of that plan and establish your ability as an organization to manufacture it at commercial scale. If you're in a regulated environment, you need to obtain approval before you launch, and then you need to make sure that the organization is ready to support the product launch. So I like an approach something like this, where you're really focused on the various milestones. And I've illustrated where I think milestones could be, but you could have them in, in any place. But the purpose of the milestone is to make sure that the organization is confident in moving forward and that you've completed the work to make sure your, your product is ready to move through the various stages and the various milestones. Decisions at each milestone, as I said, are based on our confidence to move forward and continue to invest. And importantly, I would suggest that in this single governance end-to-end -end type of uh, governance body, that the approvers at each milestone may differ and at each one of those milestones, the approvers and decision makers need to have skin in the game. There can be no bystanders. And, and I'll give one example of that where, that I was aware of where 
uh, one of the functions that really were not involved early on in evaluating uh, in a pharmaceutical world some of the clinical data. And that particular, because they were using the every committee member has an equal vote approach, um, one or two committee members were able to hold up the development program because they disagreed with the clinical conclusions from the data, even though they were not in a clinical function. So the point is that decision makers need to be representing their area of expertise, and their particular function needs to have skin in the game at that milestone. They need to either be accountable for delivering future activities as it relates to the previous work, or they need to have they need to certify that the previous work has actually been done to, to an acceptable level of quality. With this type of uh, simplicity, milestone Bates approach, I think it allows you to drive more collaboration into the process and it also should allow you to focus more on ultimately the product and the customer and not to be focusing on phases of development or individual functions or business units. I'll spend just a couple minutes on change management before we close, um, and I'll go through this quickly to allow for any questions. Uh, many of you may be aware that as many as 70% of all change initiatives fail, and there's a similar proportion of portfolio implementation projects that fail. And in large part, this is due to the fact that change management has had an inadequate focus. So this is another th place where Taken Point offers significant expertise, having done change management projects in a number of different businesses, both large and small scale. Along the change adoption curve, you need to make sure there's appropriate awareness and understanding and get people to the point where eventually they're committed. So these are the people that are in the, the participants, those that are really directly impacted by the change. You need to also make sure that key stakeholders and people that will be leading the change through the organization you need to advance them more quickly through this change curve so they can help support your efforts in communication and other aspects of change management. This is just a, a basic framework for change management that, that we like to think about at Tegan Point. You can see a number of deliverables there at the bottom, and I've actually kept this relatively short. There are a lot more that you could consider. You need to have KPIs. You need a good communication plan using various types of media. You know, how are you going to have leaders communicate through the organization, transitioning into new business functions, et cetera. So there's quite a bit that goes on with change management, but I just wanted to show you at a high level uh, what some of those things are. So in summary for my part of the talk, as far as strategy goes, you want to make sure, again, that you know where you're going and that you have a roadmap for getting there. You want to make sure you implant implement business processes that enable the kinds of portfolio level analysis and reporting that you'll need to do, and I would suggest you need to establish a single source of truth for those data. Ensure that your portfolio is aligned with your strategy and can deliver. Hopefully you can establish a single function that's accountable for program project and portfolio management as that will help facilitate a lot of these analysis and reporting that, that needs to occur. I would advocate for a, a simplified holistic end-to-end -end governance process instead of one that is based on, on phase of development or business units. And also ensure that your governance is, is based on fact and decision, uh, fact-based decision making with clear accountabilities and criteria. And lastly, don't neglect change management as you're trying to implement um, something such as Planus where or other changes in the organization because it will help you be that much more successful. And with that, I'm ready to close and we can turn it back to Teresa for any questions. Thank you. Uh, great. Thank you, Mark, and thank you, Jeremy. Uh, now we have just a few minutes left for some Q&A. So if you have questions on your mind, now's your chance to use the questions section of your GoToWebinar panel to submit them. We already have several questions, so if we aren't able to get through all the questions, we'll make, certainly make sure to follow up with unanswered questions after the webinar. Um, that being said, the, we have a question for Mark. Do you see many companies doing benefits realization in a realistic way, i.e. executives have skin in the outcomes? To answer honestly, uh, no, most of my experience is still 
uh, where the executives, particularly involved in de you know, decision making, don't necessarily have skin in the game. Um, I think we're all aware of, of, of the cultural and potential political dynamics in organizations, and it's really one of the major challenges that we need to get past in terms of how you operate in a governance setting to make sure that projects are actually delivering value and not uh, just focused on you know, someone's pet project, as an example. Thank you, Mark. Another question for Mark is, what is the role of finance in the foundational business processes? Yeah, finance, uh, that's a really good question, and it, it points out something I forgot to add to the slide. Uh, if you recall the slide where I showed program, project, and portfolio management, you would need to have finance um, tied in somewhere into that, that um, dynamic. A process that I've seen work very well is where pro project management and finance are working very closely together to make sure that accurate cost estimates are put, put into each project as well as actuals and working very closely if finance is the organization working closely with program management around product valuation uh, in early stages. So finance plays a very key role and that was a miss on my part not to have included it in that one slide. Okay, thanks Mark. Actually, um, was the previous slide the one with the contact information? Can we put that up? Do we have that on the previous slide? Um, on the uh, very first slide, I don't think we have Jeremy and I's together. We have okay. Jeremy's contact and my contact. Okay. Okay, thanks. We'll be sure to post the um, email addresses, So, and we'll make sure also to follow up with everyone that has a question. Sorry, that was just one that popped up right then. Um, another a question for Jeremy. On Planisware's user wall, can you select who can follow you? So you can't select who can follow you or deny somebody from following you. So we want to be able with the plan with the wall. It's really to increase uh, collaboration and and provide some transparency, some transparency and visibility. So, um, so there it's you know sort of like um, it's sort of like Twitter, right? You can you can follow people and they can't really deny you from following them. Um, so. Okay. So no, unfortunately okay. you can't. Great, but you can certainly choose to follow, choose who you will want to follow, and subscribe yes, to you can projects, you people, and that follow. kind. Of thing. Exactly. Great. Uh, another question for Jeremy is: Can actual numbers for revenue be imported from Oracle? Uh, yes, we have lots of different interfaces, some standard and some custom. Um, the basic rule of thumb is that as long as you and your organization know where the data is and the data structure, we can interface with it. Um, we have lots of experience interfacing with Oracle. We have a uh, we're a certified partner um, and is, have a certified interface through SAP. Um, we have some interfaces, standard interfaces with Microsoft Office, um, including SharePoint. Um, so. Microsoft Project, Excel, so lots of interfaces, and we can pull the data, and we can also push the data out as well. Great. Um, I'm going to try to pick two more questions. Jeremy, how are resource estimates for each project inputted to the model? So all of the resource data comes from the resource management module. Um, Planisware has full capability to do long-range planning, uh, manage resource capacity, uh, at demand, as well as allocate down to the named user, if you would like, um, allocate resources to tasks um, and track those. We also have time tracking so uh, users can record their time, which flows back into to the actuals. Um, because Planisware is one single system, all of the resource data uh, rolls up to the portfolio level, and that's where we got that view from. Uh, excellent. And one final question for Mark. Are all the activities and deliverables in the change management slides necessary? Which are the most important? I would say, I wasn't going to go back and pull up the slide, but I would say no, and that's a really good point. Not all of those are necessary for every change project. In fact, every change project, in our view, is really unique. 
and that all those deliverables need to be customized. So some deliverables will apply and others will not, given the circumstances, the culture of the organization, the change. Um, I would say ones that are really important are going to be a clear communication plan, clear messages around, you know, you know that are part of that communication plan, as well as treating it uh, pretty much like a project plan, where you have very, you know, pretty detailed plans for when communications are going to roll out and, and who's going to be delivering messages, et cetera. As, and then the last piece that I'll highlight without looking back is, is the stakeholder management piece. Make sure you understand who are the key stakeholders, where they are in terms of their support for the project as you initiate and do your initial analysis, and what are your plans for moving forward to, to move those stakeholders to where you need them to be so they're providing the level of support that you need for the project. Okay. Thank you. Thanks again, Mark. Um, thanks again, Mark, and thank you, Jeremy, for your presentation. Uh, thank you no to all our, our attendees for your participation, and we're at the top of the hour, so um, it's time to wrap things up. We hope everyone um, that you found this webinar valuable. You'll be receiving an email with a link to the recorded webinar in the next um, tomorrow, so please feel free to review this if you um, at your leisure, and also feel free to share the videos with your colleagues. Also, um, if you had any questions that didn't get a chance, we didn't have a chance to answer or that you think of later, um, if there's, we will follow up with any unanswered questions by email, and if you think of another question that you didn't have a chance to submit, please feel free to submit them at webinar at and I'll include that, um, the contact information in your follow-up email as well. Also, if you have any topics you'd like to request for future webinars, please let us know in the survey that will pop up shortly as soon as I end this meeting. Uh, thanks again, and please have a great day.